an interesting thing last week that I think uh, really speaks to the Americans as a, as a culture, as a nation. That only in America do we have Black Friday to go buy more stuff the day after we gave thanks for all the stuff we have. Um, you know, I was thinking as we were singing the last song, Glorious Day, that, that our eternal hope is that Christ will return. But how many of us really have that as our hope? I mean, I mean how many of us are looking with anticipation to his coming? Oh, I am. I would be a-okay with today. Um, you know, Jesus, through his parables, warned us frequently to be ready. Because his coming is going to be, at one and the same time, a great thing and a terrible thing. Um, you know, I... I like Thanksgiving. This year I got to sample the delicacy known. For the first time ever, I got to sample the delicacy known as smoked turkey. Wow, where have you been all my life? Um, I don't know if all turkey, smoked turkeys taste that good or, well, it also helped that it was two hours later than it was supposed to be, so I was good and hungry, but, uh, I was wondering, you know, I, I love Thanksgiving, not so much because of the food. Actually, over the years, um, we've actually eliminated a lot of the food that we have for Thanksgiving. Growing up, Thanksgiving was always a big event. My mom would start preparing days ahead of time. We would have between 20 and 30 people at our house. And it was usually a six or seven course meal. And you would start with toast in the morning as you were preparing the food and you would go to the, the antipasto and the bread and then you'd have salad and then you'd have, we would have lasagna and then you would have turkey and there were, there were you, you ate in shifts because you had to like lay down and digest. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I was thinking about this. Um, Do I really look forward with anticipation to his coming as much as I looked forward to Thanksgiving? Do you look forward to his coming with the anticipation that you look forward to Thanksgiving or, or even Black Friday? This, this is not a, a slam on shoppers. Good, more power to you. More power to you. I like my house on Black Friday. Um, but... Were you more excited for Black Friday than you were for his second coming? Uh, I, I think we need to, I, I mentioned a couple weeks ago, something that I believe God is trying to teach me is to have a kingdom view, okay? I'm not really sure what all that entails, but I know that it's something that is looking beyond what's right in front of me. Um, we, we tend to be very myopic. In, I would say in our culture, but no, actually just as, as part of human nature, we tend to be very nearsighted. We see what's in front of us. And I think that's part of uh, why people deal with so much anxiety. You know, um, There's a lot that goes on in life that we can affect no control over. There are things we can affect control over. But ultimately, what we have to come to the conclusion as, what, what our faith is based on, is that God is in control. Regardless of what's going on around me, regardless of what's happening to me, God is in control. And so, um, trying to have a kingdom view, um, you know, I, I was thinking about Thanksgiving, I was thinking about 
Black Friday, and I guess now there's a, a thing called Cyber Monday. <laughs> I think that's when the cyborgs take over America. <laughs> But I'm, I'm trying to look at things with a longer view. What, what does this look like in eternity? And there's a lot of things in my life that really, compared to eternity, they don't mean much. They, they really don't. Not necessarily that they're bad, but, but a lot of times they're distracting. They're distracting. Um, <coughs> I guess, ultimately, what I would, would like to say to you this morning regarding that is, let's examine ourselves and see how much of those songs we actually live out, how much we believe, and does that belief affect our actions, does it affect our thinking, does it affect our life? Are we eagerly anticipating his coming? Are we going, okay, can you just wait till you know, I get my refund from the IRS. Or can, can you wait till, you know, Christmas because I think I'm getting something really good for Christmas. Um, let's look with kingdom view at everything that's going on in our lives. Let's let our faith be built up by the promises that God has given us and he promises that he is faithful. They will come to pass. And so let's, let's kind of shift our view to look at life with kingdom eyes, with the kingdom view. So that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, we are working through, and it's been actually a, a, a bit of time since we've been on this topic. We've had things come in between. Um, I was actually hoping to have this series finished by the end of the year. I don't think it's going to be. But uh, we've been working on a family affair. And we started off with Genesis and, and how God created the family. And then, of course, right after Genesis 1 and 2 comes Genesis 3, where sin comes in. And, and the dynamic of what God intended for the family is twisted. And, and it becomes corrupt. Uh, sin enters in, and it changes things. We look at the curses. Uh, we looked, uh, spent some time talking about woman, specifically as a wife, and, and how the curse affected that, um, just, just to um, give you a, a little bit of insight, um, just so we can catch up to where we are today. Um, turn with me in Genesis chapter 3. No, you can't. It's that simple, right? Absolutely. Jesus says it very clearly. You will love the one and despise the other. And, you know, for us, that's a very dangerous thing. If you actually look through Scripture, uh, we are incredibly blessed. We can, compared to the vast majority of the world, every person in here is wealthy. And that puts us by default in a very dangerous position because you know as James says um, you've got everything you're going to get you know it's the poor that are going to receive more blessing in heaven so we have to be very wise and very shrewd in how we deal with our money are we controlling the money is the money controlling us um, the, do we live our lives such that we are obedient to God, or do we live our lives such that we're obedient to the dollar? Uh, because God will ask you to do some crazy things with the dollar. Okay? Uh, yeah. Be, be very careful. So, um, <coughs> we're going to look in, in verse 15. Uh, God has already come into the garden. Uh, the, the blame game was played. God asked Adam, who told you you were naked? That's, that's Oklahoma for without clothes. Um, 
And uh, he asked him, you know, have you eaten of the fruit that I commanded you not to eat? And, and Adam, like most men today, turns around and points to the woman. And, and actually in pointing to the woman, he's actually blaming God. Because look what he says back up here uh, in verse 12. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Okay, so, I mean, at the start, you've started off blaming God. You know, if you'd never put her here in the garden, I wouldn't have eaten the fruit. I mean, I just want that out in the open. That you, you showed her some of the responsibility. And the rest of the responsibility goes to her. Because she took the fruit and, and gave it to me and I had to eat. Okay. And then he, God turns to the woman and he says, what have you done? And she said, well, the, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Well, now, technically, neither of those is a lie, is it? Both of those things are true, aren't they? The serpent deceived her and she ate. She gave it to her husband and he ate. Those, those are very true statements, but they're incredibly wide of the mark, aren't they? Aren't they? Because all the serpent did was tell her that she would gain in knowledge. I don't even know what she told Adam other than eat. But we see as a result of this sin coming in, we see the dynamic. And all of creation changes, but specific to our subject, we see the dynamic of, of marriage relationship changes. So we're going to jump back down here to verse 15. Um, God says that uh, he's speaking to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We see that as the promise that God is giving the woman that one day one of her descendants will, will save man. Then in verse 16, he says, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. And then we, we read this last little part here. It says, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, I spoke a couple weeks ago about this. Uh, most biblical scholars <coughs> say that, that the plain reading of that misses the intent because the, the wording in the Hebrew makes it very clear that she wasn't longing for her husband like, oh, wow, I really would like to be with you. She was longing for, her, for his position. Um, if you look back to the original sin that they committed, what was the sin? Well, we say, well, they ate the fruit. We'll call it a kiwi. Do kiwis grow on trees? I don't know. We'll call it a banana. Okay? And, but what was the intent of her sin? She wanted to be like God which is the same sin that Satan <coughs> He wanted to be elevated above his position. She wanted to be up above her position. Man, he was just hungry and stupid. <laughs> okay? So what we see here is that the desire will be for your husband's position. And we see this contention come right at the beginning. Okay? We see how God designed marriage. He created man to be the husband, the steward of all the earth, and he said it's not good that he's alone. We need to find him a suitable helper. No suitable helper was found, so God made one. You think about that. That's an incredible blessing that in all of creation, these two creations were unique. Okay? But then the, the marriage dynamic changes. Well, let's read down a little bit. Uh, to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread 
till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And then God himself provided the first sacrifice, the first covering, because God provided for them skins of animals to cover themselves. Okay. Now let's back up and tear this apart a little bit. It says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, Wives, you hold a great power. And with it, a great responsibility. <clears throat> Men, you have ears to hear. But you also have a will. Now, I'm not saying women are evil. I'm saying women have a great power because most loving husbands want to please their wives. I have found that our household runs much more smoothly when Christy is pleased. <laughs> Yeah. Happy wife, happy life. <clears throat> but there is inherent in that a danger. Because ultimately, at the end of all things, who are we striving to please? God. Okay. Now, with the marriage dynamic as it was designed, that would never be a source of contention. Because both are working to fulfill the role that God had them. They are working together to accomplish their tasks. Okay? So, you listen to your wife. Boy, that, that passed the buck really backfired, didn't it? And you've eaten. And then... All of creation is cursed. Do, do you guys understand that? That as a result of Adam and Eve's sin, all of creation is cursed. It says all of creation groans. If you think about it. Um, did anybody ever notice Herbert? out there by the ramp. We brought Herbert in a, a year or so ago to make a point. Herbert's the big rock out there by the ramp. Um, Herbert groans. Herbert made me groan. <laughs> All of creation suffers as the result of sin. It's not just mankind. It's all of creation. Um, the ground is cursed. <clears throat> Thorns and thistles come out of cultivated land because of the curse. Now, now look at verse 19. He says, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Do you think about that for a moment? What does that imply? What's that? Hard work. Hard work. Well, he was working before, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. But now work, you know, that four-letter word work actually takes on a new meaning. It, it becomes toil. It becomes a labor. <clears throat> okay? So now work isn't going to be fun. Uh, my father <coughs> taught me a lot of things by example. Uh, my dad served in the military for 20 plus years. Uh, he retired from the military and then worked another job for 18 years. A job that he hated. 
and he worked faithfully 40 hours a week for 18 years at a job that he hated because it provided for his family. He never saw my dad complain about it. He just did. He got up every morning and he went to work. And it was a, about an hour drive from where we lived. So he had to leave early, early enough to get there. And you knew he was going to be late coming home. Uh, I see my dad in this verse. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Um, my dad did what needed to be done. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I gotta interject something here. You know, I, I hear this garbage all the time. You know, find a job that you love and you'll never work. You probably never eat either, okay? You're missing the entire point of the curse, okay? Um, Find a job that you love. I think a lot of people have found that job that they love. And that's why this country is so upside down. So backwards. How about just find a job? Work hard. There is an honesty and an integrity to working hard. At whatever it is that you do. Remember, we're commanded in Colossians, whatever it is, whatever you do, do it as unto God. Did anybody watch the Jetsons? Oh, yeah. I remember watching the Jetsons. And George came home one day, and, and his wife was talking to him, and um, she asked him if he had a hard day at work. And he said something to the effect, oh, it was terrible. I had to push the button three times. <laughs> I wonder if we're not too far off from that. All of creation is cursed. I apologize for drinking the water. This medication really dries out my mouth. So pray for me that this will work out. <clears throat> so, because man sinned, all of creation is cursed. How does this look? A couple weeks ago, we looked at women throughout the Bible that seemed to push beyond the place that God had given them. And I want to look at that, and I want to turn it around backwards. Um, I'm, I'm, don't go here, because I'm just going to touch on them briefly. Genesis chapter 16. This is the story of Abram and uh, Sarai, and the promise that God gave them that out of Abram... And out of Sarai would come uh, a child that God would make into a great nation. Okay? And a period of time goes by, and Sarai was not getting pregnant. And, and so they came up, she came up with this plan to fulfill God's promises in their own strength. And in the story, we see that uh, Sarai tells Abram, she says, Well, here's my handmaiden. Take her and and get her with child, and, and that will be the fulfillment of the promise. We, we live in a very different culture than they lived in, because to me that just sounds stupid. <laughs> but evidently this was something that was not all that unusual, because we see it not only here, but we see it in the next generation, don't we? And, and we, uh, we see it in, with Jacob and, and uh, Rachel and Leah. So evidently there, there was some commonality there that we don't get. But she talks him into sleeping with Hagar, and, and Hagar gets preg pregnant, and, and then because she's pregnant, she despises Sarai, and, and then there's this whole back and forth. Um, and and uh, we read in Galatians that uh, Paul reiterates that Ishmael was not the child of the promise. Isaac was. I think there's a valuable lesson to be learned there. That when God speaks something to you, uh, when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He will take care of it. And don't jump ahead of him and, and sabotage his plans. Because we also saw a couple weeks ago, Ishmael and his descendants have caused no end of grief to Isaac and his descendants. Okay, It's going on today. Uh, you look at what's going on with Israel and you look at the nations around it. That is still a direct result 
of the, the contention that came out of uh, Abram and Sarai trying to finish God's word in their own strength. So we see this thing going on. Uh, we see that uh, repeatedly Abraham, uh, Abram pleads for Ishmael, his son, uh, at the, after Isaac is born. Um, uh, Sarai sees that he uh, is getting harassed by Ishmael, and she goes to Abram and she says, they got to go because he will have nothing in common with my son. And Abram's torn. He loves Ishmael. Ishmael's his son. How, how can I put God? And he, he's, God, what, what should I do? And God says, do as your wife has told you. I will take care of it. Now think about this for a moment. I, I don't know um, the nature of the relationship that Abram and Abraham and God had. I, I really don't understand it. But it had to be something incredibly unique. Because God chose Abraham out of all the people of the earth to make a great nation out of. And through whom the Savior of the world would come. Okay? And as Abraham is praying and, and he's asking God about his son, he says, that, you know, hey, mama's not happy. There, there, there is tension in the camp here, God. I don't want to give up my son. I love him. What should I do? And God says, listen to your wife. But then God tells me, he says, because of you, because I've heard your prayer, I will make of Ishmael also a great nation. Wow. Do you see how cool that relationship is? That God would bless the sin of Abram and Sarah, and that Ishmael would now be blessed because of Abraham. We, we see the same thing in David. Mm -hmm. The exact same thing. David, he commits the sin with Bathsheba. The child is born, and, and David, David fasts, and he prays, and God takes the child. But then another child is born. Anybody know who that was? Solomon. <coughs> Solomon. And it was through Solomon that the Messiah came. Okay? So, um, God can take our mistakes and turn them into incredible things. Now, let me caution you. That is not advice to go through with your stupid things. Okay? God can, can do wonderful things with good things as well. God can do incredible things. Uh, think about all of the times that the nation of Israel was in trouble and they would ask God to intervene. Uh, and, and God said, hey, just go out here and watch. And I'll take care of it. Shut up in the city and the armies encamped about them. And, and God allows the servant's eyes to be opened to see the army of God encompassing the, the army of the enemy. God does incredible things. It's better to do right, to do good, and be blessed because of it. But for those of you that are caught up in condemnation for the error that you've committed, God can still make something beautiful. He makes beauty from our ashes. Okay? So, I'm going to deviate for just a minute because as we start to look at man, husbands, um, I want to kind of step away for a minute. In the Bible, in the Hebrew, throughout the Bible, we see two words that can be translated as Lord. Okay? And they have various uh, extensions off of the word, but the, the root of both words. The first one is Adon, from which we get the word Adonai. And the second one is Baal. Okay? Now, what do you guys know about Adon? Well, I mean, think about it. That's the name that uh, more than 300 times is used for God. Okay? What, what do you know about that name, Adon? When, when you hear that, that God is the Lord, Jesus is Lord, what does that mean? Master. 
Master. Yeah. Master. Um, it, it carries with it the idea of right relationship. It carries it with it the idea of benevolence. Well, then we look, because throughout Scripture we see this contention in Israel between God and Baal. Okay? And we see that there's this, you go to Israel today, <clears throat> if you got any spiritual sensitivity whatsoever, you will see that tension is still going on. Because who is Baal really? Yeah, the, the satanic forces, okay? And there's, there's this conflict that is still going on over in Israel today. Baal can also be translated as Lord, but what it, it really, the implication of Baal is slave owner or slave master or landlord, okay? Now, what's interesting about these two titles is I think Adon was how God originally intended the relationship between man and woman to work. Now, you see that uh, in, in uh, 1 Peter, I think it's chapter 3, Sarah is commended because she called Abraham Lord. Okay. Now, in the Greek, that's a different word. That's kurios, which is also the word that is used to reflect the, the position of Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay. That, that connection goes back to Adon, not back to Baal. Okay. And we see that the way that God intended this to work uh, and, and as we get into the solution of this, you'll see how this plays out, is that God intended that Adam be an Adon, not a Baal. But we see that sin has come in, and all too often in the vast majority of relationships, if a man steps forward and takes responsibility and authority, he almost always does it as Baal. Without concern or compassion, for those over whom he is supposed to lead. Okay? And we see this struggle, we see this dynamic happening even today. So understand that there are two types of lords that are, are spoken of in Scripture. There is a one that references almost exclusively God, Adam, Adonai. Uh, if you look in your Bible, um, you will see most oftentimes when Lord is printed, in all caps, okay, that is actually talking about Adonai Jehovah, the, the Yahweh, the actual name of God that is in there. Um, you will also see sometimes that it's a capital L and everything is lowercase. That's that's just Adonai. That's not Yahweh. Okay, so uh, read your prefix in your Bible. You'll you'll find out some really cool stuff about why your Bible reads the way that it does. So. We see these two things. We see that God intended that there would be a right relationship. Um, Thaddeus, could you fill this up with water for me, please? Um, but sin has come in. It's twisted the dynamic. Uh, now there is tension. There is contention between husband and wife. Wow, it's really weird standing over here. Okay. I'm sorry, I never stand on that side for some reason. You know, I'm going to stand over here. I'm going to talk to you guys. Um, sin has come in, and it's warped the dynamic of the relationship. Now, we see in 1 Corinthians, uh, we'll go over this in greater detail next week, because we're going to walk through God's solution to our problem was his original design. Okay, The design has been messed up. Um, one of those things that uh, always cracks me up is to, to listen to builders that um, have to build something the architect designed. Because when you're designing stuff, uh, most often you don't think about um, how it's going to get together. You just see that it fits. Uh, I was on a job site once years ago. I was helping a, an electrician. And I could hear these guys talking over in the corner. and. Um, they were supposed to put this bracing underneath this uh, section, but there was no room for them to put a hammer or even the nail gun up underneath there. And they're, they're thinking, I could hear them complaining about the idiot that designed this, and because he was not thinking about the fact that somehow or another that's got to stay there. And um, I was thinking about that uh, the other day when I was looking over my notes and uh, adding stuff. 
all too often we try to be the architect and we have no idea how to build it. We just want it to look this way. Um, so in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes out what he calls or what, what I call the order of authority. Okay? Did, does anybody here know what that order of authority is? Anybody? Christy, I know you do. God, Jesus, man, woman. God, Jesus, man, woman. Now, the first thing that we need to look at is we have to break this idea in America that being underneath someone is a bad thing. We, we have this idea that, you know, uh, the, the manager is better than the worker and that the general manager is better than the manager and that the president is better than the general manager and, and the CEO is better than the president. We have this really convoluted um, hierarchy to what we think is better and what is worse. Uh, that does, that's not how things work in God's kingdom. Because see, there, there's only two places in, in God's kingdom. There's the Lord master of all things, the almighty God, and, and that's the, the triune God that we serve, and then there's everyone else. Okay? And when Jesus came, he completely turned their hierarchy upside down because who was the greatest in the kingdom of God according to what Jesus said? What? The servant of all. The last supper, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Now, we, we don't really get this. We really don't understand this. But, but that, was, that was for the lowest of the low to do because, you know, they came in with nasty feet. And the lowest of the low would wash their feet for them. Well, here is Jesus Christ who has revealed himself as the Messiah, but also not just the Son of Man, but the Son of God. And, and here he is washing their feet. Why? To set the example. See, we're so twisted in this thing because the greatest in the kingdom of God is the one that washes people's feet. The one that puts others above him or herself and becomes a servant. So when we look at this, we see this authority that, that it goes God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, man, and then woman. And, and even a lot of men go, well, that's not fair. First, who are we to tell God what's fair and what's not fair? And second, if you understand the authority as a covering, a shield, a protection. If we understand it in light of the way that God intended it. Now, women, let me just ask you plainly. Does it bother you to be under the authority of God? Why not? Because he's good. Because he's good? Because he loves all of us. Okay. He's good, he saves us, he protects us, he's our father. Um, women, does it bother you to be under the authority of Jesus Christ? Well, why not? He was a man. Because he loved us. Mm -hmm. Because he, he loves us. He sacrificed himself for us, he proved that love for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, if that's the measure you're expecting of your husband, you'll be a widow really quick. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, that's how we, we have to prove our love for you. <coughs> okay. Um, but I understand that. Because that is the model that Paul uses in talking to men about how to treat their wives. Okay. Now, I'm going to stop here because next week we're going to get in and we're going to start tearing apart how God, through Paul, explains to us his plan for marriage and how it's supposed to work. Now, keep in mind, because of sin, work is now what? Toil. Toil. It's hard. It's something you have 
to dedicate yourself to doing. Uh, there's an old fable about the ant and the grasshopper. Does anybody know it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The ant goes out in the spring and, and the summer and he's gathering and he's storing away and he's working and he's getting things taken care of. And the grasshopper thinks, hey, you know, life is good. I'm in the sun. I'm getting a good tan. You know, I'm warm. There's plenty to eat. Why are you working so hard, you crazy fool? And, and then fall comes and the ant is working even more furiously, gathering and getting put away. And, and, and uh, the, the grasshopper is looking at him going, man, you're nuts. There's, look, all this, all the, the, the acorns are out and all this food is readily available. And then winter comes and what happens? The grasshopper has nothing to eat. He has no shelter to protect himself with. And he goes to the ant and he says, hey, 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 can you help me? Well, now, if this were uh, to follow through in, in some countries today, the government would step in and, and he'd stick the grasshopper in and, and everything would be peachy cozy. But, but see, the idea of this is the ant worked. And so when the hard times came, guess what happened? He was prepared. The idea of work is something that we have to apply to every relationship in our lives, starting first and foremost with our relationship with God. You've got to dedicate yourself to getting to know Him. You've got to be in His Word. That's the primary way that he, he exposes himself to us, that, that we get to understand who he is. You've got to be in prayer. Communication with God. And, and you know, I'll take that even further. Pray out loud. Pray out loud. I don't know why it's different, but it's different. Okay? Pray out loud. Worship. Worship. Be quiet. Be still before God. Be quiet before him. And then the next relationship, the next most significant relationship in our lives is typically the husband and the wife. And it takes work. All too often, we want to ascribe the work to the other person and describe to them what they're supposed to be doing. Christy and I were great at this. I mean, we're Bible school graduates. I could quote to her every scripture about what she was supposed to be doing. And then she'd turn around and quote to me every scripture that I was supposed to be doing. And then what's the actual answer to that is, well, you do yours and I'll do mine. And back and forth we go, back and forth we go. Okay? But ultimately, who am I going to be accountable for when I stand before God? You. Me. Am I going to be accountable for whether Christy did or didn't do what I expected of her? No. I'm going to be accountable for my actions, for my thinking. Okay? So when we read Scripture, you have to read it as God's letter to you. And periodically, there's going to be things in there where he addresses somebody else. And, and you can just kind of go, oh, okay, that's, that's not for me. And by that, I mean, when he's talking to husbands, he's not talking to wives. And when he's talking to wives, he's not talking to husbands. Uh, if it's talking about sin, that's for you, that's for me, we all got to pay attention. Okay? So next week, we're going to get into, you want to do a little bit of advanced reading, uh, get into first, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3. Uh, that's where we'll be spending most of our time.